Well, the U.S. Navy intercepted a massive Iranian arms shipment last week that was headed to rebels in Yemen. This is a third such seizure by U.S. forces in recent weeks, indicating the Iranians are pouring more funds into their military ventures now that they can sell more of their own oil. Thanks to the lifting of sanctions under the nuclear deal, Iranians are now selling more than two million barrels of oil a day, and they're buying a lot of weapons with that money. Joining me now, Fox News military analyst General Jack Keane. General, good to see you. So Yemen, for those who don't know, is generally kind of a proxy fight where you have the Iranians on the side of the rebels and the Saudis on the side of the government. I guess we're, we're on the Saudi side, right? You know, absolutely. This, this is a pattern of behavior the Iranians have followed since the Islamic State of Iran was formed in 1980. They used their proxies to conduct terrorism and also to, con to be fighters to overthrow regimes. They did this successfully in Lebanon. They, they are supporting uh, the Assad regime in Syria. They're, they are supporting their own interests uh, in Iraq using the proxies of the Iraqi Shia militia. And now in Yemen, we see them using the Houthis. This has been a successful campaign for them for 35 years. And they wow. are taking the gloves off, and they're, they are about it again. Well, is, are we in danger of getting sucked into a proxy war? I mean, this is a third shipment we've seized. Well, we're doing absolutely the right thing here. And, and kudos to the Navy and the intelligence system. I'm certain it's also helping to feed them, the Central Intelligence Agency, et cetera. Uh, Clearly, stopping them from being from arming their proxy is is a big deal. We we clearly want Yemen stabilized. We were we were forced to retreat from Yemen, David. Yeah. We had a special operations base there where we were conducting operations mm. against ISIS and also against the Al Qaeda. We had to close our embassy. We had to close our military right. base and leave. Now we want this government return to power and to stabilize it. But listen, the message here is the nuclear deal was struck in July of last year. Since that time, the Iranians have taken their gloves off. They have returned to their previous behavior. And th their behavior is their strategic goal since they stated since 1980. And that is to dominate and control the region. Well, the yes, they're going to de- Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say the irony is is that the nuclear deal that we signed on to gave them a lot more money to play with, and some of that is being clearly being used here. I just I just want to ask you to respond to one thing because we had General Mike Flynn on uh, Brett Baird did on a show that we did Friday. He said something pretty provocative about our Commander in Chief. I just want to play that side and get your reaction if you don't mind. Go ahead and play the sound. I think that he sees the military actually as something that is more dangerous to the world. And I think that he looks at us, I actually do, I think that he looks at the United States military and sees it as a, as a threatening uh, application around the world and actually as a useful tool. Now that's a pretty provocative statement, General. Do you agree or disagree? Yeah, I, I agree in part. I mean, I think the the Obama doctrine, if you want to call it that, he has looked at the role of the United States differently than any president we've had since World War II, whether they be a Democrat or a Republican. And he does not see that the United States should be operating in the world to assist and lead global security and global stability and help also to create economic prosperity. The military is part of that, but his overall strategic policy is one to pull the United States back mm -hmm. from its traditional leadership role in the world. And that is truly what has happened for the last seven years. General Jack Keane, great to see you. General, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Well, yeah, good talking to you, David. Just days after President Obama said Iran is fulfilling the letter, but not the spirit, of its nuclear agreement with the West, there are new serious questions tonight about whether the terms of that deal are quietly changing as we speak. This comes as we learn a U.S. Navy ship stopped a massive Iranian shipment of heavy weapons intended to kill fighters who are aligned with the U.S. Chief Washington correspondent James Rosen reports from the State Department tonight on heightened suspicions that the president and his aides may have tried to deceive Congress about what was in the Iran deal. House Intelligence Committee member Mike Pompeo, Republican of Kansas, confirmed to Fox News he is leading a probe, first disclosed by the Washington Free Beacon, into whether the Obama administration misled Congress on the terms of the Iran nuclear deal, also known as the JCPOA. There were specific commitments that were made to members of Congress. And we need to look into whether or not it's the case we were deceived 
by those commitments. Case in point, how the U.S. would treat ballistic missile tests by Iran once the deal was in force. After the implementation, if they launch these types of missiles, is it or is it not in violation of the agreement? It is a violation of Security Council resolutions. Yet the State Department hasn't called the regime's recent ballistic missile test violations of U.N. Security Council Resolution 2231, which bans such tests. Instead, American diplomats say the tests are, quote, inconsistent with 2231. Did this administration mislead the Congress or deceive the Congress about the terms of this deal? Dear, uh, very pointed question. Uh... No. Treasury Secretary Jack Lew assured lawmakers last summer. With very limited exceptions, Iran will continue to be denied access to the world's largest market. Now, however, Treasury has all but confirmed it will allow Iran access to U.S. dollars through selected foreign banks, a welcome development to Iran's rulers. They think they've gotten everything they wanted from the West, particularly from the United States. Money, credibility, international recognition and trade agreements. Well, was that part of the deal that was briefed to lawmakers at any point? Uh, I'd have to look back and see if it was in the original text. I, do, I don't have yeah, that you, don't, you don't recall it having been in that text. I don't do recall you? it. With concerns mounting about Iran's regional aggression, the Pentagon disclosed that a Navy patrol ship last week intercepted a vessel carrying hundreds of rocket-propelled grenade launchers and thousands of AK-47s believed to have been bound from Iran to Yemen. I don't think our picture of Iran has, has changed all that much. Congressman Pompeo said his probe into the selling of the Iran deal will start out informal, but will ramp up to include subpoenas and the like if the administration proves uncooperative. Brett? James Rosen at the State Department. James, thank you. With Palmyra retaken, pro-government forces are pressing ahead with their campaign to cut off ISIS supply routes through the oil and gas-rich desert around the city. Last week, with Russian air support, they swiftly retook the nearby town of al Tain in ISIS hands since last spring. Pakistan's prime minister is vowing to eliminate the terrorists responsible for an Easter Sunday attack targeting Christians that ended up killing almost three times as many Muslims. All told, at least 70 were killed in that attack. Correspondent Connor Powell looks at what happened. A day of celebrations for Pakistan's small Christian community quickly turned to tragedy after an attacker detonated a bomb filled with nails near a children's playground on Easter Sunday. The explosion was very loud. As we rushed over here, we saw a pool of blood and people laying here. There was no proper security here. At least 70 people were killed, more than 300 wounded, many women and children. Jamar ul Alra, a Taliban faction who pledged allegiance to ISIS, claimed responsibility, saying they were specifically targeting Christians, though most of the victims were in fact Muslims. This weekend's violence, the deadliest in Pakistan since the massacre of 134 schoolchildren in Peshawar more than a year ago. That attack prompted a government crackdown on Islamic militants, who proved again they are seemingly able to strike when and where they want. Today, Pakistan began observing three days of mourning. In Lahore, businesses and schools were closed. While security forces protected government buildings in the capital city, Islamabad, thousands of Islamic supporters took to the streets Monday to protest the government and demonstrate against the execution of a Pakistani police officer who shot and killed a Christian governor five years ago. Pakistan's military has long differentiated between good militants who strike in Afghanistan and bad militants who attack in Pakistan. And despite U.S. efforts to convince Islamabad to end this policy, Pakistan's military shows no willingness to do so. Brett? Connor Powell in our Middle East newsroom. Connor, thank you. Azerbaijan says 16 of its soldiers and two civilians have been killed in fighting over a disputed region in Nagorno-Karabakh, an area controlled by ethnic Armenians. It comes as the country's defense ministry blamed the Armenian military for artillery attacks they say are continuing. The situation around the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict is to be discussed by mediators in Vienna on Tuesday during a meeting of the OSCE's Minsk Group, which is co-chaired by France, Russia and America. 
The Azerbaijani Defense Ministry has released footage claiming to show the destruction of a military command center at an undisclosed location in Nagorno-Karabakh. News of the strike first emerged on Saturday when Baku officials, officials claimed the barracks was hit in a pinpoint artillery strike. But the ethnic Armenians controlling the area have denied it. Here's RT's Murad Gazdiev with more. Amidst all the confusion and propaganda, we wanted to see what's happening with our own eyes. The fighting here dies down, heats up, uh, as it often does. Right now it's uh, heated up. We've made a stop here near some uh, undergrowth, uh, hidden the cars away. Apparently just down the road, a bus carrying seven Armenian soldiers uh, was hit by a shell. Uh, no survivors, so we're waiting for things to calm down. It wasn't a short wait. Eventually, we got going. Notice the scorch marks in the fields. This was filmed seconds after an Azerbaijani grad rocket impacted just a few hundred meters from us, prompting everyone to take cover at a nearby military site. North Korea's dictator Kim Jong-un pushing the button once again, flouting the latest tougher sanctions by launching yet another provocative mis ballistic missile into the Sea of Japan. This time, Greg Palcott joins us now live. He's in London. So, Greg, what have you learned about all of this so far? Martha, Martha, again, the rogue nation flexing its muscles. A lot of people saying they have to be taken seriously. This time, following a recent short-range missile test and other provocative moves, Today, there was one, maybe two mid-range missile launches. They went about 500 miles into the Sea of Japan, again, defying U.N. resolutions banning such activity. Critically, some experts right now are saying Pyongyang might have been testing a heat-resistant nose cone for a nuclear warhead, like the one allegedly shown in a picture with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un earlier this week. That is necessary for any long-range ballistic missile. The U.S., which is continuing its own war games with South Korean forces, already reacted to this latest word. State Department saying that North Korea needs to, quote, refrain from actions, uh, further raising the tensions in the region. Very diplomatic language, Martha, in uh, recent weeks, which I've heard uh, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un say that he wants to strike America with nuclear weapons. Yeah, he's talking about Manhattan uh, with lots of um, bellicose language. Now, they also have a student, uh, Otto Warmbier, a UVA student who was studying in China, now in a labor camp in North Korea. What's the latest on that, Greg? Yeah, we're getting a little bit more information about that. Let's remind our viewers what happened on Wednesday. Uh, he was sentenced to a 20, he was sentenced to 15 years of hard labor by a North Korean court. The 21-year-old UVA student said to have committed a crime against the state. Actually, he took down a poster from a hotel he was staying at. Recent activity spotted at North Korea's nuclear complex has been described as both suspicious and unusual. 38 North, a U.S. website that monitors the North very closely, says that satellite imagery over the past five weeks shows plumes of exhaust steam from a thermal plant used to heat the Yongbyong Radiochemical Laboratory. 38 North says it's not clear if Pyongyang is trying to harvest weapons-grade plutonium from spent nuclear fuel, but U.S. Intelligence Chief James Clapper testified in February that North Korea has been operating the plutonium production reactor long enough that it could begin to recover plutonium within a matter of weeks to months. 38 North also says Pyongyang is making progress in construction of a light water nuclear reactor, but says it's unclear if that will become operational this year. This analysis comes just three months after North Korea carried out a nuclear test, which it claims was a hydrogen test. And the North Korean leader Kim Jong-un says that he has every intention of continuing to develop and test his nuclear program. Paula Hancock's CNN Seoul.